it the um, is it the Bali one? Oh yeah, I use I use WeChat. Or not WeChat. Um, WhatsApp. That uses. So it's just a place where you post stuff for twenty four hours to forty eight hours, so people can download it because it's new. No, an email with blocks it's a big file. So that sounds good. I have a great which means there's going to be one of the expectations in so that's uh, <coughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's I've only had one teaching semester I had to do the school. So I had my NSF grant I yeah. earned, and then all my research has been self funded through applying for little grants. It's yeah. awesome. And I'm going to try and make a guidebook for our program where I leave about all the little pockets of funding that are available to, to apply for. It is a lot of work. Yeah. 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 Y
until we hear us. Because I'm certainly going to have the power to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Say, John, can you hear us? That's good right now. They say it's I should just wait two days. Wait a year. All right, thank you all for coming and joining us. This is the last seminar of our series, Early Career Contributions in Coastal and Climate Science. Uh, today we have Stephanie Stefanski joining us um, from Duke University, where she is a PhD candidate working under the direction of Marty Smith. Uh, Stephanie earned her master's in Yale, from Yale under the guidance of Bob Mendelson. Uh, she also earned a double Bachelor of Science in Economics and Political Economy at Tulane University. She's currently a graduate fellow at CSYNC, and she's also had three years of funding under an NSF uh, graduate research fellowship spread over the past five years to fund some really interesting, exciting work in Argentina and Patagonia. She's traveled extensively through Latin America. She also holds citizenship in Argentina. She also holds citizenship in the U.S., and she holds citizenship in Switzerland. So if you get a chance to, to meet with her, it's a, a really interesting story. That, that's kind of the background of that. So I, I'd encourage you to, to poke at it a little bit. She's also a former Watson Fellowship with, uh, uh, with IBM. She worked for the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, where she was a project consultant doing economic analysis on whale watching. She's already published in Marine and Resource Economics, uh, Ecosystem Services, Forest Policy and Economics. Uh, usually at this time I say she's going on the job market, so she's looking for feedback on her talk, which I'm sure she is. Um, but like some of the speakers we've had in the past, she's already been scooped up um, well in advance of the job market, and Stephanie will be joining McKinsey and Company in D.C. to continue doing work in, in Argentina and some developing country work um, starting next August. So way ahead of the game there already. Um, she's also a wilderness first responder and a dive master professional scuba diver. <laughs> so that's uh, certainly an interesting person. I hope you have a chance to meet with her, and I'm looking forward to what she has to say. Thanks for joining us, Stephanie. Thank you, Jake, and thank you, everyone, for attending today. I'll be presenting on the, the bulk of my research, which is my second chapter of my job market paper, which is titled Use It or Lose It, a Bioeconomic Model of Utilization Rules in a ITQ Fishery. And I'll get into what all those words mean here in a second. And so very broadly, worldwide, there's a movement towards property rights-based management to manage pollution through cap and trade, water trading rights and water quality, and fisheries harvest, such as uh, through fisheries individual and transferable quotas, or ITQs. There's also a growing concern about the social and economic outcomes and goals in these different types of property rights-based management regimes. So while many of these are built and designed theoretically to achieve economic efficiency, there's a growing concern of what might be the social consequences of some of these um, some of these programs, and there's some work such as by Kaylin Croats at Resources for the Future looking at the efficiency costs of building social objectives into these different program designs. And another growing concern, especially in the fisheries sector, is quota underutilization. But this also occurs in water trading and in export permits where uh, users might use or lose their permits so if they don't use in a sufficient amount they might permanently lose the right to fish to access that water resource. And this can uh, often result in very unintended consequences. Uh, however, from a policy perspective, it's a measure to incentivize the productive use of these permits that could be producing uh, export earnings and uh, providing for food security for local communities. And then finally, fisheries are important because they're a key contributor towards export earnings, food security, and employment worldwide, and particularly in developing countries such as Argentina. And so this is a, a broad background of where my research fits in. Uh, but before we go any further, I'll just, to just explain what is an individual and transferable quota. So in traditional fisheries management, uh, there's a total cap, the total allowable catch, that every fisherman has access to to fish. 
This invokes a race to fish where every boat goes out with the biggest, fastest motor and achieves that total allowable catch in a very short span of time. In Alaska, there was derby fishing where the entire season would shut down in two days. This was very dangerous for the fishermen that often had to go out in very bad climatic conditions and not really useful for people who want employment and dollars year round. And so economists, in response to this race to fish, developed individual and transferable quotas from the theory of property rights and Hardin, where you assign and allocate individual rights to fish based on a number of factors, typically historical landing. So a, a larger boat that might have caught more in the past will get a larger quota as represented by the bigger fish, and a smaller boat that has a smaller historical catch will get a smaller quota. But if one wants to buy more or uh, fish more or fish less, they can trade or transfer that quota <laughs> amongst each other. However, this has often led, especially in Alaska and other coastal communities, for smaller boats to sell their quota share to the larger offshore trawlers and lead to a consolidation of the fleet, which might be more economically efficient, but leads to social questions about the, so uh, the social impacts of this quota system, because now you've lost a lot of the traditional fishers, the artisanal fishers, etc. And so because of these social questions, places like Argentina started to think of different ways to design their individual and transferable quota system. And so this leads to my overarching research question for my entire thesis, which is how does policy design influence firm behavior, including their participation in the quota market, so how much they buy and sell, uh, fishery ex entry and exit, so in which fisheries they choose to fish in, and the timing of their harvest decisions. Are they really spreading their harvest out throughout the entire year, or is there still a race to fish occurring in some sense? Uh, and my advisor, Marty Smith, and his student, Anna Birkenbach, who's now at Delaware, have looked at this extensively and have found that the re results are really mixed and often differ from what we see in the theory. And so I'm building on this research and seeing what happens in Argentina when you take a very traditional model and add a thousand modifications to it. And the theoretical framework for my project is based off of two strands of literature. The first strand of literature is building off of kind of the fishery economics and ecological literature looking at how fishery harvest decisions change under uncertainty. And there's a large strand of literature dating back to, um, to 1979 with a focus on the social planner perspective, which would be like NOAA. So when you have a social planner trying to manage for the entire fishery and social goals, <coughs> and you have ecological uncertainty, what's the optimal harvest decision? What's the optimal quota? And this is often a two-period decision model, and there could be environmental, market, or institutional uncertainty. Now, I was reading through this literature, I found it very interesting, but what was missing to me was the firm perspective, which led me going into economics, um, industrial organization literature, so looking at production uncertainty. So if you're a firm or a company producing iPhones or widgets, how do those production decisions change under uncertainty? And then there's also literature of option values, such as quota or permit as options. And this is a, a focus from the firm perspective. And the key here, especially if you're looking at uh, how many patents should a firm bid for, or how much production should a, a firm plan when they have a kind of two-period uncertain decision model, is that under uncertainty, it might be optimal for them to incur a short-term net loss to maintain the future option value of holding the quota. And this is what I was seeing in scenarios where there's a use it or lose it um, penalty, where many firms are going out and either fishing more or using more water than they need to, and that might be incurring short-term costs, but they really want that long-term future value, especially if they think that market price will increase in the future or the abundance will change in the future. And so just, I won't get too much into the math, but just to give a little illustration with this two-period model. So we're looking at the firm, he fishes the first half of the year, which is M1, and then doesn't really know what's going on, observes the market and the ecological conditions, and then the second period can update his production decisions. Does he keep fishing? Does he sit at home? What does he do after he sees what the conditions are like? This is a profit maximization. It has a lot of funny letters, but really the key here is, um, so we have rho T, which is our discount. We have price P. And then that middle part is their effort for the whole year. So alpha is a capture coefficient. Maybe it's the type of net they use, the type of engine. Uh, e is the effort, so the no number of days they go out fishing, how many nets they set, uh, to the beta. So that's just another factor. And then multiply that by x, which is the stock. And this is going to be our key formula for my empirical model that I'm about to show you. 
And so there's just a, a list of the different variables. And then we're constraining their fishing behavior by the environment, by X, which is the stochastic stock. It changes every year with, with some shocks, but it's generally stable. And the number of quote, the amount of quota they can catch. And the key here in my model is that's less than or equal to. A lot of social planner models look at exactly equal to. But if you can use less than your quota, you might lose that. It should be a less than or equal to sign. And then if we just look at what user or loser would actually look like in practice, so they have their annual profit function. On the top line, they could either capture just what they feel like capturing, whatever their effort is. And on the second line, they would just capture exactly their quota amount. And if they capture less than 90% of their quota, so the Y is their threshold, then their quota for the next year, QT plus one, would just be what they caught this year. So if they only go out and catch 90 tons out of their 100 ton quota, next year their quota will only be 90 tons. And I'll keep decreasing until they find an equilibrium Q bar. So in this case, they have some equilibrium quota that should generally be sufficient for whatever, if it's a good harvest year or a bad harvest year. And what I expect to find is really, we'll just focus on the last part here, is that in a really bad year, if they have that equilibrium quota that they want to maintain that has those option values, uh, and they go out and fish in the first period and there's really no fish to be had or the market price is low, they will exert more effort in the second period to avoid the use it or lose it penalty. And so they really want to maintain that equilibrium. But if it's a really good year and they go out in the first half of the year and there's lots of fish or they make a good value, then they can relax a little bit more in the second half and still maintain that quota and keep themselves in equilibrium. So that's just kind of the theoretical underpinning of the <coughs> empirical model and case study I'm going to explain today. So why am I discussing, we, we talk about fish and there's a lot of math numbers, what's, what's going on here? So Argentina in 2010 designed an ITQ program to achieve social and economic objectives. They called in experts from New Zealand, Canada, Iceland, the US, and they saw the consolidation happening around the world. While they wanted their fleet to consolidate because they wanted less, uh, fewer boats in the ocean, they didn't want to lose their very important coastal communities and the small ice trawler boats that go out and catch fresh fish and process it on land. So they worked with a number of experts worldwide to design a program that would somehow balance the offshore fishermen and the coastal fishermen. And it took them 10 years to design this program. So they started talking in 1998, and it was implemented in 2010. And the four fisheries they implemented ITQs in represent 25% of their total fisheries export value. The other 75% is largely captured by shrimp, squid, um, shrimp and squid pretty much, which have really high economic values, a really high abundance, but they fluctuate so much annually that it would be very difficult to apply a quota to manage those species. They, so some of the things they implemented were a permanent and temporary transfer. So they put a tier limit on leases. They didn't want armchair fishermen, which were just fishermen sitting at home, leasing out their quota, bringing in the rents, and not fishing. They said, if you fought for this quota for 10 years, you better use it or we'll give it to someone else. They also put in a unidirectional trading restriction. So to try and prevent the coastal fleet from selling all of its quota to the offshore fleet and shutting down shop, said you can't do that. You can only sell amongst each other. And the offshore fleet can sell to you, but cannot buy. So that was trying to maintain two separate markets of quota. And then finally, they designed the user or lose it provision, which is the key of uh, today's talk, which is vessels will lose their quota for insufficient use. So if they use under 90% two years in a row, that's gone. Um, in 2013, recognizing that this is pretty stringent under uncertain ecological con conditions, the administration developed a uh, reallocation fund. So if you think you will not use quota in June, so halfway through the season, after you've observed the market and ecological conditions, you can give up the quota or you can keep using it. And to give a sense of how these fish are valued, so the four species they're monitoring are Chilean sea bass or Patagonian toothfish, southern blue whiting, Argentine hake, and Argentine hoki. And these are commodity goods. They capture about the same value as hake from the US or anywhere else in the world on an international market. And Argentina exports at least 85, if not 95%, of all its catch to international markets. So they're price takers, they're not price, they're not setting a price. And there's one non-fish species in this list, which is our little red friend, the shrimp. And this is important because this is an alternative, unregulated, not regulated by quota species uh, that's very lucrative. So it's $6,000 a ton, 
Whereas any whitefish species, they're only earning two to three thousand dollars a ton. So this is an important player in the ITQ program in Argentina. Another important factor in Argentina is you have a divide between the north and the south. So the Patagonian, the Buenos Aires port in the north, primarily Mar del Plata, and various remote Patagonian ports. So this is the population density. You can see that life really just circles around these ports. And these ports are, their primary forms of income are tourism, oil, and fisheries. And so we had a really big debate between these two cultures during the design of the program and between the types of fishing vessels. So from the left here is the largest factory vessel you can have. In the middle is the freezer trawler. It looks very similar to the ice trawler, but the freezer trawler stores on board all of its catch and exports it directly. A lot of times they process on board too. And the ice trawler puts it on ice and then lands it on shore for processing. And then you have these little tiny boats that are wood or metal hulled boats, very small, usually less than 30 meters, way less than 30 meters. And those are also going out to sea, catching, and then processing on shore. And the data I'm using, I have a lot of data to work with, thankfully. Uh, the government was very generous in collaborating. So I have legislative documents from 1998 to 2018 trying to make sense of what this policy is. I have annual ITQ reports that show the allocation, sales, and purchases each year, uh, I, the percentage of ITQ use or non-use, how much they've given up, and their social quota allocation. I also have monthly fisheries data that I use to calculate fishing effort and landings, and monthly economics data such as fuel price and export prices and the exchange rate, everything adjusted by the producer price index for Argentina for these different goods, and semi-structured surveys with fishery stakeholders. Because as an interdisciplinary researcher, I think it's really important to always listen to my stakeholders on the ground and make sure that what I'm researching reverberates with them and has some grounding in reality. So my survey, we'll start with the survey, because this kind of drove the entire process, is a semi-structured survey uh, with seven, now there's about 10 industry representatives, um, and about 15, because I did more surveys a few weeks ago, 15 managers from different Buenos Aires and Patagonian ports that are fairly representative of the fleet. So I, I talked to everyone from the largest multinational company in Argentina to the smallest president of the small little boats that we saw, that we see in this photo here. And what they told me was their principal concern in the fishery sector was an integral visionary of fisheries management that takes into account ecological, economic, social, and technological factors. But even more important than that, they said they want macroeconomic conditions that support the fishery regardless of the type of management in place. And specifically, low prices for whitefish products and high costs for fuel and maintenance and importing um, equipment for their vessels really drive up the costs and make it very difficult to run a profitable business, especially with the low prices. And then finally, they brought up the red shrimp. So the changing ecological conditions of this really high red shrimp abundance that kind of exploded in 2005, and no one really knows why it's exploding, it just keeps tripling every year, um, has led to a lot of uncertainty in the sector and what the future looks like for fisheries in Argentina. And then finally, uh, fish stocks that used to be the staples, anchovy, hokey, whiting, are now so dispersed or difficult to find, or no one wants to find them, that there's really a lot of uncertainty about what's happening with those stocks as well. Now, when I looked at the program design, uh, I was surprised to find, well, first I heard about all these debates. So at the, in 1998, you couldn't bring two fishermen from different ports or different fleets to the table together. It would just be a harsh debate, and they couldn't even talk to each other. 10 to 20 years later, through the implementation of different commissions, chambers to foment discussion across the sectors, now it's a different story. But the 20, 10 years it took to design the ITQ program, it took 10 years because of all these really fierce debates in the design. Uh, there's also a big problem with initial allocation. So in a lot of ITQ programs, how you initially allocate the quota is a big issue because economic theory would say, well, they just buy and trade it'll reach an e the ideal equilibrium. But if I'm a small owner that just got a lump sum quota, and that's money I didn't have in my pocket before, and I have a kid to take care of, or a car to fix, or something else, I'm more likely to just sell that quota and take the cash, but then getting back into the fishery would be really difficult. Or, alternatively, um, might not even have the money to buy more quota if I wanted to fish more than what I have. And so, initial allocation was very, um, controversial, especially because they were taking data from the early 90s and for a program they wanted to implement in 2010. 
And a lot of these vessels had historical <laughs> underreporting, so they call it, it either black, which they mean illegal, so they'll call it trabajo en negro or trabajo en blanco. If it's in white, that means it's a legal form. If it's gray, that's like cooperative, so we know they hired from a cooperative, we just don't know how many people they hired. If it's in black, that means they went on the street and said, who wants to go clean fish today and just hired whoever there was, and there's no paperwork for those employees. Argentina wanted to, did allocate quota based on labor, uh, historical landings, investment, and production. And some of those numbers were very easy to get, and companies that had all their papers in order really supported this initial allocation, and the smaller companies that didn't have their papers in order really didn't. And so I learned that a lot of those smaller companies were appeased by an, an additional kind of social allocation at the off onset to help them be involved in the, in the fishery. And finally, their biggest objective for this program was to sign quota with the lowest economic and social impact possible. They want to end the Olympic fish in fishing, and they want to improve oversight and monitoring. Uh, officials have also told me they want to maximize employment and maximize efficiency, which are often two goals that go in direct conflict uh, with each other. And so how do they do this, or what do the businesses think about this design? The businesses told me they really like these social administrative reserves. It gives them additional quota to improve their profitability. They can just go to the government and request additional quota in many cases and receive that quota if they meet the right, um, the proper forms and everything. However, in the Patagonian toothfish or, uh, what is it, Chilean sea bass uh, fishery, it's led to a race to fish more quota. Everybody wants to use their quota as fast as possible so they can ask for more quota. Uh, for business operations, every manager across the board has told me it's led to better predictability and planning. If they own 400 tons of quota, they're going to fish 400 tons of quota, they can have all their factories set up for 400 tons of quota. Or as under a race to fish scheme, they might get 400 this year, 50 next year, and two, 300 the year after that. So they like the better predictability. Everyone's observed a fleet consolidation, although there's questions whether this was driven by the ITQs or just driven by those macroeconomic factors and the shrimp fishery. Um, and that there's better control and oversight. And even and a lot, I even went to one of the um, sindicatos, the, the labor unions, and they said they even thought there was better work contracts put in place afterwards because now everybody wants quota, so they're keeping all of their papers in better, better form. And then for the market, because another important question is what happens with this ITQ market? It should be generating rent until it reaches equilibrium. And for Hake, it did generate two different markets. So the ice trawler fleet, has a much lower best, um, per ton value of its fishery because they have less, um, no, there's, everybody wants quota, nobody wants to buy quota, nobody wants to sell quota, so it's a really difficult position, whereas the I, freezer trawler fleet, the offshore one, they can sell to the, the, nobody wants to sell, everybody wants to buy. So it has a really high value and they often wait for a company to exit or they try and get quota in other ways, consolidate their boats and maybe get a bonus for doing that or say they'll keep, the, I've even met uh, owners of freezer trawler vessels that are said to only process offshore, let's say they start processing onshore to get additional quota. So there's even these stories of it going against the stereotype. Uh, for the toothfish, it's a completely stable market. You have four players, nobody wants to get rid of quota, nobody sells quota, and they just wait for extra handouts or for somebody to exit or get a fine from the government and take that quota. And then for the Hokie and Whiting, the quota doesn't even have a price because nobody wants to fish it. So no one's even, and those uh, user or lose it provisions are set to 40% of the quota. So it's very low, maybe an ice tr freezer trawler goes out and fishes it and just gets his quota in one harvest and that's it for the season. Uh, what I should mention is of these four fisheries, only Hake has the small scale vessels and the coastal vessels. The others are all offshore factory vessels, like that one image we saw on the left. And then quota price, as it is in a lot of places in the world, is strongly correlated with the ex-vessel price and the export price. Um, and the creation of these additional reserves, such as the social reserve, the reallocation fund, has kind of disincentivized trading. No one's going to buy quota from you for $700 a ton. They can just get it for $3 a ton from the government. And even if that's on a temporary basis, with uncertainty, a lot of them will prefer to have the, the temporary quota anyways. And now these I didn't translate to English because the key here, so keep an eye, this is perspectives on ITQ program. We're looking at the ice trawlers. If it's blue, that means they're in agreement with nice things I wrote about the ITQ program. And if it's in red, it means they're in disagreement. A lot of red for the ice trawlers, a lot of blue for the freezer trawlers. And the freezer trawler companies are the ones that tend to have their papers in order. They're the big international companies. So 
even if everyone says that they kind of like the, the ITQ program when I ask them point blank, when they filled out this long list of agreement and disagreement, it seems like there's still a division in who is actually benefiting from this program or in agreement with it. And then finally, they told me, so just in the interest of time, um, the one thing that nobody liked, no matter who you are, is this user or lose it provision. The policymakers like it because they say it incentivizes productive use of the quota, and the quota could be valuable in the future. So people don't want to lose it because they want to maintain it. The firms say that they, they would rather be out fishing shrimp for $6,000 a ton than hake, but if the shrimp stock uh, disappears tomorrow or collapses, they want their hake stock as an option B to fall back on. They don't want to be frozen out of the fishery. So they'll give up quota for free on an annual basis to avoid insufficient use penalties when they know they can target shrimp or something else. But a lot of them really don't like this policy, and they say they have to go out in December, so in a bad year, they have to go out during the end half of the year to fish their quota. So I decided to look into this further and see if what they're saying was actually true. Um, so I see, yes, nobody's really using their quota. So this is that dotted line is that 90% threshold. And we see for the factory processors not really using it, the ice trawlers are falling short or right at that limit, and the coastal trawlers always fall below the 90% limit on average. Whereas the freezer trawlers, they're reaching that 100%, but they're the ones that are happy to take more quota. The ice trawlers say this is unfair because they're not allowed to sell to those freezer trawlers, but they have to give up their quota so the freezer trawlers get it anyway. That's what they told me. Was it happening? We'll find out in a second. Next, they are giving up quota. On average, they give up between 15 and 45%, which makes the dynamic discrete choice model very difficult because it's not a one zero decision. It's a, it's a range of decisions of how much quota to give up. And it looks like, so if we're looking at the left of the zero, that's given up quota. If it's in a yellow or warm color, that's a coastal boat. If it's in a blue color, that's an offshore boat. And we see the coastal boats are largely giving up quota, and the offshore boats are largely receiving quota. Um, but the government pointed out they try to give it to other coastal trawlers first, so that's the group of yellow you see there. But they don't ask for it because they're fishing shrimp, so then they end up giving it to the, the offshore vessels. That's what they say at least. Um, so I did an empirical analysis to actually get down into what's driving this decision to give up quota. And so what I'm using is, so we go back to that first function I had, which is that it's the Schaefer harvest function. So it's your catchability co coefficient, which was alpha, now it's Q, the level of effort, the amount of stock, and then the eta is your little stochastic shock. And harvest, H, will be some function of that, those multiplied together. And if we use math and take a log transformation of that equation, I get a first stage regression equation. So if I regress the log of each vessel I's monthly M harvest in year Y as a function of their um, catchability coefficient, so I just do a vessel fixed effect um, plus the log of their effort level I have for each month and year, and then plus um, a year month fixed effect, which gives us delta, which ends up being a proxy for ecological abundance, and epsilon, which is our uncertainty. If I do that in the first stage, I'll get a sense of what their expected harvest might be. And I'll take that expected harvest H hat and use it in my second stage equation, which is how much percentage of quota they give up, so fractional logit, as a function of the current market prices. So P at, um, price for shrimp, S, price for hake, and the price for fuel, F plus the number of vessels they have, because if you have a lot of vessels, you might be able to switch quota around or send one out to um, fish hake and the rest can fish shrimp. Whereas if you only have one boat, you really do have to decide between what you're fishing. And then the, the expected harvest. And this will give me a better idea of the underlying mechanisms driving why are they giving up quota. Is this really a market story? Is it an abundant psychological story? What's, what's going on here? Um, so in the first stage, I get what I expect is that as your log of effort increases, um, your log harvest increases, generally positively um, correlated, and I used vessel fixed effects, year month fixed effects, and now per the recommendation of my colleague Anna, I'm also looking into fleet fixed effects and seeing how that might make the results um, even more robust, um, but they seem pretty, pretty similar across the board. And just to sense, so these are every single boat and his coefficient for fishing. So some are really efficient. They have a, a capture coefficient that's greater than zero. The ones that have a capture coefficient less than zero, those are the really inefficient boats. They might go out and exert a lot of effort and catch really little harvest for what they're exerting. And then I take that and I predict, so I, I use that two-stage model from earlier. So I predict 
Given how much they harvested in the first stage, in the first half of the year, up till June, what's their predicted harvest for the rest of the year? And how does that expected total harvest for the year influence their decision to give up quota? And so, as they have a higher log expected total harvest, they have a lower percentage of giving up quota, a lower chance, um, lower percentage that they give up. Their number of um, vessels owned by the firm is also negatively correlated with somewhat how much quota they give up, which is what I expected to find. But interestingly enough, hake price and shrimp price have nothing to do with it. So I went back to Argentina a few weeks ago. I asked them, I said, why? So everything I do, this is a, just the regression result. Here's my coefficient elasticities, which is zero. And Marty and I were stumped. I said, why is this the case? And I said, well, any Argentine fisherman that complains to you about price, it's never a price story. It's always a cost story. Our prices have been fixed for the past 10 years. You always get about 2,000 US tons. $2,000 per ton for hake, and you always get $6,000 ton per shrimp. So the prices have always been fixed, so that's why I couldn't even do a numerator good, because it's always the same ratio between the two. Um, but I said the cost should tell you something more, because the cost is what drive everything. So I, I threw in the fuel price, and there we see if the fuel price um, goes up, the percentage of quota you give up goes up as well. So if it's costing you a lot of money to go out and fish, you're just going to let the quota sit and hope that you can either give it up for free, which is what they're doing here, and avoid the penalty. And then when I take these predicted values and just do a little scatter plot and I add the colors again, so blues for offshore, uh, warm colors for coastal, we see that um, the, the ones that tend to give up the most quarter, that are predicted to give up the most quarter, are those coastal vessels. And if I shock the environment and change the abundance drop, we see overall how much they give up is in response to this kind of ecological abundance. Um, but once again, it's always kind of the coastal vessels that are incurring the larger costs of this program rather than the offshore vessels. And so if the government was trying to protect the coastal vessels and get them more quota, that doesn't seem to be the case. Now what could be missing from this is not that we're looking at the ecological abundance of hake, but what's the abundance of shrimp. So I'm waiting on monthly shrimp landings data and include that in the story and see how the regression might shift. Because it might not be that there's less abundant hake, it might be the, the months are not shrimp uh, fishing hake, they're fishing shrimp. So it looks like there's lower ecological abundance, but really is that there's a higher abundance of shrimp, and so they're going after that. And then finally, so I take that kind of price range, so $700 a ton is what an ice trawler vessel earns per, per ton of quota sold, and 1500 is what a freezer trawler um, loses. So while on a percentage level, it seems that the coastal vessels are losing more percentage of quota because they generally hold a lower amount of quota and the quota holds a lower value, those rent losses are lower for the coastal trawlers than a freezer trawler that might have 2,000 tons of quota and 10% loss of that at a higher value is worth a lot more. Um, but this I'm going to work on a little bit more to think of different ways to calculate the welfare loss. I also want to look at if they're predicted to use their full quota or not. Because if they're not even predicted to use the full quota, they wouldn't be losing the full value of that quota. And so in summary, um, well, the evidence not so mixed anymore as much as they explained to me the issue of prices and costs. Um, this is a dynamic decision, hence the two periods and, and two stages. Um, and historically, there was initially a high level of quota trading in both fleets, but now they're generally in equilibrium. And there's disincentives to trade because we have these extra administrative reserves, social reserves, and all these other additions to the ITQ program that are kind of disincentivizing trading. They were meant to help the coastal vessels. That doesn't seem to be the case. So there needs to be some additional flexibility built into the program to help those vessels. And I'm still trying to think, because I always like to be a positive person, under what conditions might this user lose a policy uh, be at least a second best policy. And I know in the US, uh, one thing we've thought about is these ground fish fisheries that have a lot of quota left sitting on the table each year because they really have non-selective fishing methods. So is there a way that this could incentivize more selective fishing methods or lower bycatch. Uh, for example, in Argentina, there's a lot of high grading. So if you catch a small little juvenile hake, you might throw it overboard because it's not worth a lot. But if you want to achieve your quota, you might keep it on board and at least land everything you catch to avoid that penalty. So it might be a, a good method to discourage discarding and high grading. So I'm still, still thinking about this. Um, so the next steps is to work a little bit more on evaluating what are the economic efficiency costs of this policy. Uh, further estimate the drivers of these, um, these give up decisions and look at how the shrimp fishery might be playing into this. 
and then expect to find the different outcomes across the different fleets and ports, and I'm trying to get some more location-based data as well. And so with that, I'm right on time. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so kind of continuing with our trend, one of the things that we ask all of our speakers is to talk a little bit about their experience conducting interdisciplinary work. So last week we had Malin Pinsky in here, um, and when we asked him this question, he spoke about his work with Eli and, and Sila Bin's lab and um, discussed kind of the, the, the quirks between you know, biologists and economists. Um, I think certainly I, I can see how your work is inspired by a lot of their work. Um, but also, what I find particularly remarkable about what you're doing, uh, and what I know of, of the rest of your research program, is this: how your your communication and interaction with policymakers, especially in Argentina, feed back into your work in, in the actual process of your work, uh, and how you've been able to kind of push the needle in affecting policy in Argentina, which which is quite impressive, especially for a graduate student. Um, so maybe also if you could speak a little bit about how you expect your work with McKinsey to to continue doing this work. Um, how those teams might formulate what the challenges might be, uh, and how your experiences to date might might help you be successful in that work, and where you see yourself going. Great, thank you. I'll start. I'll start with that because that I think is a little bit more unique to my PhD experience. I think everyone's had the interdisciplinary experience, or most of us are familiar getting on the same page about terminology, about methods, making sure you understand if it's a panel regression, longitudinal uh, regression. I spent a lot of time in succinct and other group um, projects, just working on understanding the terminology and methods across different um, teams. I've had people tell me to my face that economics isn't another tool, it's another mindset that should be discarded. So trying to keep a, a happy face when you're being told that your entire field is, is garbage um, to people. Um, so those are the more difficult situations, but I always just try to be positive. I try and listen to what other people say and think about how we can come to the same page. I always, there's a book Communicate uh, conversations between anthropologists and economists. I just like to say, hey, there's there's really nice um, there's really nice possibility for us to come on the same page. And so that I did a semester at the Marine Lab with Lisa Campbell. Took a course on political ecology. Uh, I took a course with Javier Basurto, which inspired kind of this 20 year analysis of the whole institutional being of this ITQ program and synthesis, and really trying to understand the ins and outs and why all these funny laws came to existence. And so that's what really led to these policy discussions, was wanting to capture the, what I really admired in the anthropological and political economy fields and take it into the economics world. And so when I went down to Argentina, my first goal wasn't just to tell them, hey, give me all the data you have, but I actually spent a full year before this project ground truthing what are the problems you would like studied, what do you think economics is, and another surprise I always found was that a lot of biologists think we're just conservation finance, so let's just calculate the value of upping tourism or protecting this or the value of whale poop. So I've been asked some very interesting things to value. And the other thing is always maintaining your boundaries. Because yes, maybe that does fit into environmental economics or economic valuation. But if it's not quite within your line of what you want to work on, you say yes, you listen, and then think of how you can take what people are telling you and convert it into something that is in line with both of your interests. And so not a lot of people named the quota program to me when I was first doing my groundwork, it was a lot more related to marine mammals, but I wasn't going to get any data on bycatch or discards. I would have loved to have studied marine mammal by, uh, discard it, bycatch issues and economic incentives to reduce that. But when I worked with the administration, there was no possibility of getting that data. It's very controversial. They, they would rather have their own people focusing on that and not have an outsider, because there's many cases where an outsider comes in, takes one piece of data and says, look at this horrible thing that's happening, and throws the whole system underwater. When really it might have just been one outlier in the data set. And so to make sure I wasn't doing anything controversial that could be upsetting and put into risk future relationships, I thought, okay, well, I can't do marine mammals, so we'll set that on the side. I'll still work as a whale watching guide on the weekends. Um, what else could I do? And Marty is working on fisheries and ITQs. I said, well, Argentina has an ITQ program, and there's only one EDF report on this program. Let me look further, and I dug a little deeper, and I didn't really know much about ITQs. So I had lunch with Kaylin Crote, so always reach out to your contacts, and she works on ITQs in the U.S. and in, our, in Latin America. So I sat down with her, and she goes, huh, this design's very odd. You should look into it more. And that kind of opened the door. I started look, delving more into the institutional design aspect, brought that to Marty. Marty's an economist, so I also brought him numbers. How much is this fishery worth? Where does it export to? What does the volume look like? 
How does it compare to the Gulf of Mexico? It compares quite evenly with Gulf of Mexico production. And so it showed him that this has a high economic value, uh, understudied research area, and some potential for new models and empirical applications. Then I got Marty on board. So I had Marty on board. Now I have to go get the Argentines on board. So I went back down to Argentina, and I had a contact there, Anna Parma, who worked at Pew and is a fish very well-known fisheries scientist and very well respected. She gave me the context for the uh, Undersecretary of Fisheries that gave me the data. And then I just started doing door-to-door -door knocking for businessmen. So businessmen don't want to be bothered, especially I, I arrived last summer right when there was a sinking of one of the boats in my data set. Ten mariners died um, due to bad weather conditions and poor maintenance of the boat. And I show up in the middle of this where there's a lot bigger problems on the plate than this PhD's thesis on the quota system and everyone's fishing shrimp or dealing with this issue, but I was very persistent and I sent out emails, I went door to door, I had a nicely printed letter um, explaining what I was doing, and I eventually piece by piece got people on board to take the survey. And then they started passing me numbers of other people to take the survey. And while that is a snowball sample, sometimes it's the best you have, because I was calling every number on my list every day, there's 200 numbers to call, and I got yelled at by secretaries, I got chased out of buildings, um, but persistence really helps, so I kept going back, and then I was telling a story at lunch today. When I went back this um, a few weeks ago, I still hadn't met the top boss of the Undersecretary of Fisheries. And I had his WhatsApp number, and that to me was very odd. Like, why do I have this top government official's WhatsApp number on my phone, but I don't have his email? I didn't even realize he was a top government official. Just some businessman said, you need to talk to this guy, and sent me some contact information. I said, I'll just send him a message. So I send him a message. He goes, yes, come to my office on Friday. I'll be free then. I go, great. So I show up to the office. And I get in the elevator with another businessman, and I go, I know this person. And he's looking at me like, I know this person. And I go, Lissandro, Stephanie. And it was one of the people I'd interviewed the previous year. So we start talking. Then we get up top of the elevator. Another guy shows up. He goes, Stephanie, how are you? It was the guy who gave me the number for that person. And here we were in a room, because then another person showed up, and we're all talking about my research. And they actually, as a new guy shows up, they stop the conversation, look at him, and go, he needs to take your survey. So here I had all the businessmen kind of being really supportive of the research, and then they wanted to introduce me to the Undersecretary of Fisheries, and then he said, please let me know what you do. And then I gave him a lot of my, I made a little preliminary two-page report. So the other important thing about surveying stakeholders is you have to show them what's in it for them. So I, did my, I wrote up all my results and did a two-page summary of what I learned from all the preliminary surveys, and I sent that out to everyone this year. And then when I reached out to new contacts, I said, if you take my survey, I will share with you this two-page preliminary report. Because a lot of them care a lot about what the others are saying. And everybody wants to know what the other guy is saying. So that got more people on board. And so yesterday, I don't know if it's because of my report or not, but I noticed there's some new updates coming into the policy that seem very similar to the complaints that I seem to be addressing the same complaints I heard and wrote about in my preliminary report. So they're making the user lose a little bit more flexible. There's these things called biological halts that everyone also hates. They're making those more flexible. And they're, they're adjusting kind of the concentration limits of the quota. So they're seeing the government's very open to listening. And so that's what I've always tried to learn. So be open to listening, get everyone's opinions on board. You can't always please everyone, but I think if people feel like they've been listened to, I had interviews that would last four hours because I would just be sitting there nodding <laughs> and writing. Um, I would often bring an iPad with me and I had a Qualtrics survey on there that's um, secure. So that way they take confidence that I'm not just going to be carrying around their confidential data in my purse, but it actually goes to a secure cloud server. So they liked that. Um, just professionalism, listening, those are kind of key things I've learned from working with anyone, either other researcher, politician, or businessman. And I think with McKinsey that will, so I noticed the part I enjoyed the most about my research was talking to people, listening, and seeing how policy influences. And I realized that is a part of economics, but it's really hard to get funding, especially to keep working in Argentina to do that. So I thought, well, maybe I'll go get some more experience and learn more about the business side of things. Because a lot of times these businessmen were surveying them, like, could you help us with our costs? Could you help us think of other ways to do this? And I've had whale watching companies ask me that. I've had business, the fishing companies ask me that. And every time I said, I'm an economist. I'm not a financial analyst. I'm not a, a cost cutter. And I always felt like I fell short of their expectations. So I think. McKinsey will help me gain those skills and I can bring it all together and contribute it to a foundation or NGO or come back as a pro pra professor of practice. So we'll see. Great. Any other questions for Stephanie? Yeah.
an anthropologist, watch out. I want to say that as an anthropologist who has criticized economists quite a bit, I really enjoyed your talk. Oh, thank you. So I commend you for all the work that you've done, you know, interviewing people and stuff like that. But what I'm concerned about is in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, one of the issues that they're concerned about now is the recruitment of new fishermen into the into the fisheries since it's so expensive under the ITQ program to get into these fisheries now. So is that a concern? And I mean, what happens when these these big firms exit the fishery and nobody can buy that, has the money to buy those quotas? So there are people that do have that money. And so unfortunately, it's a loophole. Argentina, in principle, should only have Argentine flagged vessels fishing in its water. But what happens is you go to an office and they say, come meet our vice president. And you go into that office and you're face to face with a Chinese businessman and Chinese writing all over the wall. And, or it could be a Norwegian businessman. Or it could be a U.S. businessman. So Red Chambers, a U.S. company, has bought up one of the Harangus that shut down last year, one of the biggest processing plants and fishing, and they got all the quota for that. But they operate the business with the same Argentine name. They keep Argentine personnel on board. Um, but the vice president or managing officer and the parent company is now either U.S., Chinese. Uh, one of the two fish vessels is owned by a Norwegian company. So there's a lot of foreign investment showing up and investing in these companies. And so that's creating a whole other controversy of, well, aren't these Argentine vessels? We want labor. For it's the same controversy in the U.S. Oh, immigrants um, taking over our jobs. But they're really... In some cases, I see really nice situations of, I interview the son of the, ma the grandfather who was at the table in the 90s get working with the permit system and the quotas. And like, it's a family business, and they've kept it the same all the time. But those are the companies that are shutting down. And who's coming in to save them is different international firms that uh, they still have. All the, all the processing plant workers are still Argentine. All, all of the labor below the top tier labor is all Argentine. So you're having more of these mixed international companies. And because 99% of the catch is exported, these companies are doing that so that they can get a good deal on the products for their country. So the Chinese-owned country exports everything to China. The U.S.-owned company exports it all to the U.S. So I was out in Wan Chi's and there was a guy out there, uh, Daniels, and he, he had some boats operating off. He showed us on his computer while oh, we were yeah, talking. He had some... He had some boats operating off of Argentina, so was he just, how was he doing that? Was he in international waters? So there's, um, the other big problem Argentina has that you read a lot about is the illegal fishing that happens right on the EEZ border. So their EEZ border, unfortunately, dips in. So it's the only place in the world where it's dipped in slightly before the continental shelf. So there's this ideal fishing ground that's just no man's land. And you can go on globalfishingwatch.com and click all the likes of the Taiwanese, the Spanish, I'm sure U.S., Chilean, Chinese, all the international vessels from the world fishing in this tiny little <laughs> footprint of an area right where the EEZ kind of cuts away. And a lot of times they do come over. So in the news last year, the Argentine Navy uh, shot down a Chinese vessel. They found fishing in Argentine waters. Um, but that was not good for trading relations or anything else. So... And other times I've gone to the port in Puerto Madryn, and they have a Spanish vessel there, and it's uh, been stuck there for months until the government pays the fine to free the vessel. So they are trying to enforce this illegal fishing, but there is a lot of fishing. It's not legal or illegal. It's a, a no man's land. It's that one little space. And so he might have been operating there. So, yeah, building off of uh, one of David's questions, when they these kind of... Uh, companies from other countries buy into the ITQ system, um, is there some sort of requirement that a lot of that non-managerial or whatever labor is Argentine, or is that just something that they're choosing to do? I mean, are they like required to do that, or is that at this point they're just choosing to do that, but they could at any point kind of stop? So, I think it does depend on the immigration laws and who they choose, because I did notice um, the squid vessels, for example, which are heavily financed by the Japanese. They're, I mean, the technology is their technology. Um, all the mariners on board those tend to be of Asian descent or origin. And so I don't know. I think it depends on the, the immigration laws and who you've talked to in the government. Um, but Argentine labor is also super cheap um, with, if you have a foreign currency, especially now with the peso devaluation. And they earn, every export, export is earned in dollars. 
So this actually just came out in La Nación because if you've read, Argentina is the worst currency in the world right now. The peso devalued by half. Um, it's really great if you want a steak dinner there, but it's really <laughs> heartbreaking. I was paying like double tips because I felt so bad. Um, what happens is these companies, they export a, a ton of hake for $2,000 U.S. ton. A few months ago, that was about $40,000 um, U.S. dollars, or 40,000 pesos. And now with the devaluation, that's doubled, so it's like 80,000 pesos. But their employees are still earning the same 1,000 pesos a month they earned the month before and the month after. So s salaries are stable. Fuel costs are stable. So the costs are in pesos. The earnings are in dollars. And so a lot of these companies shouldn't be complaining in the last few, few months because they're making off really well. And I think it actually just came out in the news that the aluminum processing plant has like tripled profits because of the devaluation. So um, if they can pay wages in pesos, than that kind of, and a lot of them, what they're doing in, the, in Argentina to substitute for cheaper labor is hiring mariners from the north. So there's no limit on where the, the person can be from. So rather than hiring mariners from the coast, they're hiring them from the tropical forests of the north that are landlocked because the labor there is much, much cheaper than the southern labor. So we do see some of the substitution, but I don't know the formal requirements for hiring. So uh, in the inshore fishery, are those are those owner-operated? Um, Usually. It depends. Sometimes it's a bigger company that has a few of the coastal vessels and a few of the offshore. Um, but none of the owners really go out to sea. There's a captain's uh, union, and so they hire different captains. And not even the same captain might operate the same boat. Sometimes I have a friend who's a captain, and he said he would just switch between different boats, depending on who was hiring that day. Like John? John. <laughs> yeah. Do they have an administrative fee? <coughs> To, you know, to the government. They have an administration fee to the government. They have fees to the unions. Um, so when they list out some of their top costs to me, it was these government fees and the union fees. The permits they they've only the permits are no longer issued. So the permit gives you access to the fishing grounds. The quota gives you access to the fish, and you need both to fish. And the the permits were distributed in the 90s, and they stopped distributing them in 98 when the hake stock collapsed. So what's happening is you have these really old jalopy boats. That the ones in the photos that just like wood paneling that's falling apart worth half a million dollars because they have a shrimp permit. And so it's also because there's uncertainty if the permit will transfer if you buy a new boat, there's disincentive to invest in newer boats. So you just try and keep using the boat you have. And the permit is what gives it its market value, not the actual hull. So yeah. you mentioned that the hate collapsed. And I'm, I'm curious about. Biological, I'm a biologist, yeah. biological aspect of this fishery. Yeah. Uh, are you seeing declines in catch per unit effort or a fishing mortality? Is it high relative to what it would be in an unfished population? Like that side of the management, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about how, how biologically s sustainable are these fisheries? That's right, I forgot to. I was going to include what the historical landings in TAC looked like before and after the quotas, so I have a nice bar chart. So the TAC before the collapse was about 300,000, 400,000 tons. And the landings before the collapse were up to 800,000 tons. So there was no enforcement of the TAC whatsoever. They implement the quota system, and you can even see um, from the, the biological numbers of reproductive stock and just regular biomass, it collapsed. And since then, it's, it, after the collapse, 98 to uh, 2009, it was kind of stable. And then after 2009, when the quotas were implemented, it started increasing. And it's now, it's not back to the same numbers it was pre-fishing, but it is back. It's coming up. It's coming up. And I think the fact that the TA has stayed stable all these years and that fish catch has stayed stable, I think that's a positive sign that if there was some lying going on or under-reporting, we wouldn't see that biomass increasing at a stable rate. Uh, the other issue is that in a way, the shrimp is doing everyone a favor because no one's fishing hate. The, t the, the total allowable catch that's allocated to quotas is underfished every year. So you even have more of a precautionary boundary. Because they're going after the $6,000 dollar dollar shrimp. Ton. So and what they do to prevent by bycatch, because the other big issue here, because I almost did a whole bioeconomic model on shrimp and hake, and I read all the biological papers and parameters, is that the hake and the shrimp live in the exact same zone. Um, Share on the map. Uh -huh. and, and because they live in the same zone, the capture is pretty much overlapping. 
And so what the government does is when they see that the, the heap to shrimp ratio rises above a certain number, they shut down the shrimp fishery. So when I was there, October 31st was the last day. So all, does that little arrow show up here? Yeah. yeah, so they catch all the shrimp from Comodoro Rivadavia, the big gulf. This is all mm -hmm. closed for shrimp production. So now they go offshore and they fish it up to Puerto Madre and Peninsula Valdez and they land in all these Patagonian ports. And so the whole shrimp and the hake stock are here. Now right next to it is a closed area that's been closed for 10 years for protection of the juvenile hake. And so further offshore, if you look on a map, it's giant squares. And if you go to Global Fishing Watch, you can see the outline of this protected area. No one can go in there. Everyone has an AIS tracker. If the mm -hmm. prefecture sees you're in there, they call you out. And now they're starting to allow you to fish there if you're just doing shrimp prior to that October 31st deadline. And once the bycatch of hate gets too high, they shut down the shrimp fish um, fishery. So that's what they're trying to do to kind of make sure that hake stays protected, not from fishing, but from bycatch. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's thoughts that anchovy and others might be recovering. The problem is the government only has one research vessel, so they rely on shrimp, um, fisher surveys or like fish data. So it's very fishery dependent data, so it's very hard to know what's actually the stock status. Any last questions? We're at two o'clock. So, just curious, why, why are those prices so question. constant for, for hake and shrimp? This is the international market. So white fish internationally is just, it's not a valuable fish. You put it in your McDonald's fish sticks, fish or, whatever, sticks yeah. or whatever. And so then it, shrimp, the red, so you can go to Sam's Club today or Trader Joe's and you can buy a package of Argentine red shrimp. My dad eats it every night for dinner. It's a large, meaty, it's a substitute for Gulf shrimp. Uh -huh. So it gets a higher price than that, um, than the Caribbean shrimp, those little, or the farm shrimp. It's, it's sold as wild caught shrimp. So it's getting that price added price value. And um, sometimes it's even mislabeled as Gulf shrimp. So they're getting the same price boost that Gulf shrimp gets. And so they're a little bit higher above that kind of farmed or like smaller shrimp you see elsewhere. Right. So we have um, five o'clock beer at Pitt Street Brewery, dinner after that if you'd like to join. Uh, and then taps tonight, Rebecca Ash is gonna talk about why dolphins aren't as charismatic as we think. <laughs> uh, so we'll see you then. Thanks Thank for you us. everyone.